Welcome to the Full Moon Film Buff, episode 106. We're going to talk about Howling, New Moon Rising from 1995. I watched this on Amazon Prime. I had not seen this before. We start with the prominent crew and cast. You can also find links to a more complete credit list in the show notes. This film was written and directed by Clive Turner. The effects makeup was by Jerry Macaluso. Now, I've previously discussed Clive Turner when I discussed Howling 4, the original Nightmare from 1989. Jerry Macaluso began his special effects career at 17, working on Scarecrows. At 18, he became the youngest effects supervisor for a major film, The Unholy. He later worked on Toxic Avenger sequels and co-founded Soda FX in 1993. Macaluso has also sculpted for toy lines and plans to start his own toy company. The crew includes Clive Turner as Ted Smith, Cheryl Allen as Cheryl, Sally Harkham as Evian, John Ramsden as Detective, and John Huff as Father John. I could find no biographical details about the cast. None of them have long or extensive credit lists. Uh, recommendation, I gotta be honest, folks, no. This film is widely considered one of the worst entries in the Howling franchise, and it's for good reason. It's a low-budget affair with amateurish acting, a confusing plot, and almost no werewolf action. Shots are lifted from previous movies or repeatedly reused to pad the runtime. Volume levels are frustratingly inconsistent, and a significant portion of the runtime is dedicated to poor music performances and country line dancing, or really bad jokes. Howling New Moon Rising is the seventh installment in the Howling franchise. This film is notable for both being directed by and starring Clive Turner, who had been involved with the series since Howling 4, the original Nightmare, as a writer and producer. The plot of Howling New Moon Rising attempts ugh, to tie together elements from previous Howling sequels, particularly parts four, five, and six, using recycled footage and convoluted explanations. Presumably to pad out the runtime and tie the storylines together, this film feels like it's the result of a bet. Let's cover that synopsis. Four men have uncovered a buried corpse in the desert. The victim is related in some unspecified way to a circus that recently came through town. Father John tells the inspector that the killer was a werewolf. How does he know? They don't answer. Mysterious biker Ted Smith arrives in the small desert town of Pioneer Town. Ted and three men have a bad dad joke contest. Ted gets a job at the local honky tonk. Father John tells us the Inquisition saved the werewolf baby 500 years ago in Howling 5. Ted confesses to a tape recorder that he has nefarious plans for Pioneer Town. Another stranger who seems to know Ted shows up, gets drunk, and is then killed by a werewolf. Finally, Ted steals a briefcase of cash. The dead guy has Mary Lou's picture from Howling 5. Some woman named Cheryl starts to investigate Ted. Don't know why. Father John spins a yarn that it's been three years to the day since Mary Lou shot David. Apparently, it takes werewolves three years to develop their powers to their fullest. Then, on the next full moon, they gain the ability to turn others into werewolves. Cheryl breaks into Ted's room to check the briefcase, which turns out to contain cassette tapes. Now, Ted knows that Cheryl suspects him of something. Father John thinks Mary Lou has possessed someone else's body. How? Don't know. The werewolf attacks Ted and a drunk jerk who is giving Ted a hard time. Only Ted isn't killed. The drunk jerk is. The locals suspect a mountain lion did it, but find no other signs of a cougar. Father John talks to Marie Adams, the survivor of Howling 4. She tells him her story. She identifies Ted as a tow truck driver in her movie. Ted has been seducing this older woman named Evian, and they finally hook up. The next morning, Ted disposes of what looks like a bloody shirt. It's actually paint on it, but it convinces Cheryl and the rest of the ladies that Ted is guilty of something. The locals find Ted's secret recordings about their drama and secrets. For this, the sheriff takes him in for an aggressive physical interrogation. Ted resists and knocks the sheriff out. After Ted leaves, the werewolf kills the sheriff. The inspector and Father John talk to Ted, who can explain everything, except the pair don't buy his stories. We get a confirmation that Mary Lou is the werewolf when she kills Marie. The inspector spins a Columbo-level theory of what went on, including snippets of whole scenes we have never seen in any of the movies. Turns out Cheryl, who's really Mary Lou, framed Ted when she helps him escape. She shoots him, but the gun is loaded with blanks. She transforms, badly, the inspector fails to kill her with his pistol, but when the whole town opens fire, they succeed. The end. Werewolf transformations in New Moon Rising are minimal at best. 
The film relies heavily on stock footage from previous entries in the series for most of its werewolf scenes. When we do see original werewolf content, it's brief and not particularly convincing. More importantly, the film doesn't add anything to werewolf lore. It rehashes concepts from previous Howling movies, such as werewolves being vulnerable to silver and transforming under the full moon. There is an attempt to create a conspiracy storyline involving werewolves, but it's poorly explained, and it doesn't introduce any new or interesting elements to the mythos. Now, themes. Howling New Moon Rising illustrates how a promising concept can be undermined by poor execution. The film brings up the theme of a close-knit community harboring dark secrets, a concept that has potential for creating tension and unease in horror narratives. However, it fails to develop this idea effectively. The premise of a seemingly idyllic small town concealing sinister truths is rich with storytelling possibilities. When done well, it can make viewers question the nature of community and of personal facades. Unfortunately, this film barely scratches the surface of these themes. Instead of delving into psychological and social implications of shared dark knowledge, the movie gets lost in this convoluted plot. The theme of community secrets is present, but underdeveloped, serving mainly as a red herring for why Ted is in town. The narrative's lack of clarity makes it difficult for viewers to engage with the story or connect with characters. As a result, Howling New Moon Rising misses opportunities to create a truly unsettling atmosphere or comment on broader social issues. It serves as a cautionary tale in filmmaking, showing how poor storytelling and lack of thematic focus can squander even the most intriguing of premises. So let's talk about the challenges faced by long-running horror franchises, particularly when attempting to maintain narrative coherence across multiple sequels. The seventh installment in the Howling series makes a ultimately misguided effort to tie together plot threads from its predecessors, resulting in a film that exemplifies the pitfalls of franchise fatigue. By trying to connect disparate elements, from the previous films, New Moon Rising creates a convoluted storyline. This approach backfires spectacularly, producing a narrative more likely to confuse and alienate audiences rather than engage them. For newcomers to the franchise, I can't imagine if this is your first Howling movie, this film is impenetrable. Without prior knowledge of the series, viewers are adrift in a sea of references and callbacks lacking context or explanation. Even more problematically, even longtime fans of the Howling series are equally bewildered. The connections to previous films are forced or illogical, failing to provide the sense of continuity and payoff that loyal viewers might be hoping for. Compounding these issues are the technological and budgetary limitations. New Moon Rising is infamous for its low production values, which are glaringly evident. The heavy reliance on stock footage is particularly jarring, creating a disjointed visual experience, further muddling the confusing plot. This approach breaks immersion and serves as a constant reminder of the film's financial constraints and better previous installments. The decision to cast non-professional actors, potentially born out of necessity, further undermines the film. Awkward performances and stilted dialogue delivery make it difficult to connect with the characters or buy into the story's premise. This lack of acting prowess is especially detrimental in a narrative requiring audience investment to navigate its complex plot. Perhaps most damaging for a werewolf movie, this film's limited special effects fail to deliver the transformations and creature designs that are integral to the subgenre's appeal. The scarcity of any convincing werewolf effects not only disappoints genre fans, but also highlights the movie's inability to live up to the standard set by its predecessors or by contemporaries in theaters at the time. Rather than revitalizing the series, it underscores the difficulties of maintaining quality and consistency in long-running franchises, especially when resources are limited. Sometimes in the effort to create continuity, filmmakers can inadvertently alienate both new and existing fans, ultimately doing more harm than good to the franchise they seek to sustain. So if you like Lycanthropes, like, share, and subscribe. Contribute your thoughts and additional observations in the comments below. Let me know what I missed or what you noticed. Next, I plan on discussing Wilderness from 1996. Keep your eye on the moon, a silver bullet in the chamber, and we'll see you back next episode.